besties, have you ever been so stressed out and started hyperventilating and you wondered why your fingers went numb and your head started spinning like crazy? Welcome to the wild world of respiratory alkalosis. Where hyperventilation isn't just about heavy breathing, it's a full-blown pH meltdown. Let's get started. Now let's chat about respiratory alkalosis, which is the hyper little sibling when it comes to the acid-base family. Unlike with respiratory acidosis, where the lungs are just basically chilling out on the couch all day, this time they are on energy overdrive. We're on that energy drink bender, breathing way too much and way too fast. We call this process hyperventilation. When the lungs start to overachieve, just like I did when I was in nursing school, they start to blow off way too much CO2 left and right. Normally CO2 is going to want to meet up with water in the blood to form something called carbonic acid, which is ultimately going to break down into hydrogen and bicarbonate. But if you're getting rid of CO2 faster than your body's able to make it, then there's going to be less carbonic acid floating around. This means fewer hydrogen ions are hanging out, which drives up our pH. It's like turning up the volume knob on our alkalinity levels. At first, your body might try to adjust. Cue the bicarbs stepping in like a referee. But if you keep on hyperventilating, you can think of it like that friend that's been on the treadmill for hours and just refuses to hop off. That CO2 level is going to keep plummeting, those hydrogen concentrations are also going to keep dropping, and before you know it, you're floating in the land of respiratory alkalosis. So here's the moral to our story. If your patient's breathing is more dramatic than the final episode of your favorite binge-worthy show, then they're probably ditching too much CO2 and teetering on that alkalotic territory. So here's how these troublemakers are going to send your patient down into the rabbit hole of respiratory alkalosis. First up, we have head injuries. Think of your brain's respiratory center, that is your medulla oblongata, like the conductor of an orchestra. A head injury can actually scramble the conductor's signals, causing the lungs to hyperventilate like they're auditioning for an Olympic event. Less CO2 in the blood means that we're going to have fewer hydrogen ions, so the pH is going to soar higher than a kite. Bam, we have respiratory alkalosis. Next up, we have anxiety-induced hyperventilation. We've all had those panic moments, myself included. Heart racing, breath quickening, and sweaty palms. In full-blown anxiety mode, some patients hyperventilate so wildly they're practically fanning themselves with each breath. All that extra exhalation is going to flush out that CO2 at warp speed, dropping our hydrogen levels and sending our pH into alkalotic territory. Next up, we have pulmonary emboli. This occurs when a clot hitchhikes to our lungs, blocking blood flow. The body's going to freak out and the respiratory rate kicks into high gear, trying to suck in more oxygen. Q hyperventilation 2.0. Oh, once again, the lungs are going to go into CO2 purge, which is going to lead to dangerously low CO2 levels. And then lastly, we have mechanical ventilation. I want you to picture this. Picture a well-intentioned but overzealous personal trainer who just keeps on yelling, breathe, 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 breathe. If your ventilator settings are cranked up too high, meaning you're going to have too many breaths and too big volumes, patients are basically overbreathing. Bye bye, CO2, and hello, respiratory alkalosis. You're going to want to make sure that you dial down those vent settings before the patient's pH goes off the charts. With all of this chaos happening, the body's built in repair crew is going to kick in when that CO2 drops and that pH rises. This process is called compensation. Initially, the respiratory center in your brain is going to try to pump the brakes on this hyperventilation. Think of it as your medulla oblongata tapping on your shoulder and whispering, dude, maybe you need to chill. This can help retain a little bit more CO2, but it's not going to fix the underlying issue like we saw with the ventilator settings being on maximum suck or a massive panic attack you may not be in full control of this situation. Renal compensation is here for the long game. Your kidneys say, fine, you want to ditch this excess CO2? We'll adjust on our end. So they start off by excreting more bicarbonate through the urine to balance out that low hydrogen environment. Fewer bicarbonate ions in the blood means your pH can inch back down from the clouds. However, again, this is not a quick fix. Your kidneys move at a let's stop and smell the roses kind of pace. So this can take hours or even days before you actually start to see a real shift in your blood gases. 
Relying purely on your kidneys for compensation is like putting a band-aid on top of a gunshot wound if the cause of hyperventilation is still cranking away. Whether it's a brain glitch, an anxiety meltdown, or your vent settings gone wild, unless you address the root cause, your patient will stay in this alkalotic wonderland for far longer than they should. So let's take a quick stroll through our body systems to see what might happen and why. Starting off with our neurological system, we have dizziness and confusion. When CO2 levels drop the blood vessels, especially in the brain, respond by clamping down, known as vasoconstriction. Normally, CO2 levels hanging in our blood helps keep our vessels open, known as vasodilation, ensuring that we have a nice and steady flow. But when CO2 levels hit the road, that relaxation factor goes out the window, and those vessels start to tighten up like they're on caffeine overload. Less vasodilation means we're going to have less blood flow to the tissues, which is ultimately going to lead to that head in the clouds kind of symptoms like dizziness, confusion, and sometimes even fainting. Next up, we have tingling, especially around your mouth and your fingers. In an alkaline environment, hydrogen ions are going to be on vacation. This means there's going to be less competition for binding sites on albumin, which is the protein that calcium likes to hook up with. With fewer hydrogen ions hogging up all these spots, more calcium is going to end up binding with albumin, leaving less free calcium floating around in our bloodstream. This drop in that free calcium is going to crank up our nerves excitability, causing the classic pins and needles sensation that we feel, especially around our mouth, our fingers, and our toes. For the musculoskeletal system, we have muscle cramps and twitching. With less calcium available at the neuromuscular junction, we start to see these fun surprises like twitching, cramping, and even those dreaded carpal pedal spasms. That's when your hands flex up like a T-Rex, but not in a cool way. You can also see things like tetany. If things get really out of hand, that hyperexcitability can progress to sustained muscle spasms, something we definitely don't want happening in this situation. The cardiovascular system is also going to take a hit, and we're going to see palpitations and tachycardia. Your heart might speed up to compensate for less CO2, and maybe because it's low-key starting to freak out. Patients may complain of feeling this racing heartbeat. Eventually, we could also see hypotension take place. Certain blood vessels, like those in the the brain are going to constrict due to those lower CO2 levels. Meanwhile, electrolyte imbalances like the shifts we see with calcium and potassium are going to ultimately disrupt normal vascular tone and cardiac function. This combination of vasoconstriction in some areas and suboptimal electrolyte levels can cause occasional drops in our blood pressure, meaning the tissues might not get enough blood flow that they need. This is ultimately going to result in our patients feeling weak, dizzy, and downright wobbly because our circulatory system isn't delivering oxygen and nutrients as smoothly as it should. And lastly, we have our respiratory system. We're going to see deep and rapid breathing, like with hyperventilation, the obvious hallmark sign. All right, let's get to the nitty gritty of what we need to do when it comes to respiratory alkalosis. Our number one priority is to fix the cause of the acid-base meltdown and fix it ASAP. If we don't address the underlying cause, we're not going to be able to fix the underlying issue. In the meantime, we're going to use the handy dandy mnemonic calming to remember the key nursing interventions. C stands for check your ventilator settings. We want to make sure that our ventilator settings are not set to hurricane force winds mode. Overventilation can blow off too much CO2, so collaborate with your respiratory therapy team to make sure they're getting oxygenated appropriately. A stands for address the anxiety. Anxiety tends to be the number one culprit when it comes to hyperventilation. You can do things by creating a soothing environment, offer guided imagery or relaxation techniques, and administer anti-anxiety medications if prescribed to keep those CO2 levels from vanishing faster than free donuts in the nursing room. L stands for labs. We're looking specifically at our electrolytes and our ABGs. As we've discussed, respiratory alkalosis can mess with our calcium and our potassium levels. That's going to ultimately lead to those tingling, muscle cramps, and that overall weird sensation. M stands for monitor vitals and trends. We're really going to want to keep a close eye when it comes to our respiratory rate, heart rate, blood pressure, and oxygen saturation like a hawk. 
Spotting a pattern when it comes to rapid breathing or even dropping our blood pressure early can save our patient from a one-way ticket to Crashville. And of course, I stands for interprofessional collaboration. You want to make sure that you're chatting with your care team, that's your physicians, your respiratory therapists, everybody involved in order to tweak treatments, assess sedation levels, and adjust mechanical ventilation. Remember, teamwork prevents chaos. The N stands for need sedation or analgesics if available. Let's be honest, pain and uncontrolled anxiety can fuel hyperventilation. If your patient's writhing in discomfort or losing it to anxiety, they're gonna blow off CO2 like there's no tomorrow. Sedation or pain relief as ordered can slow down this frantic breathing. And lastly, we have G, guided breathing techniques. We wanna teach slow, controlled breathing. Sometimes we call this pursed lip breathing where we purse our lips together and breathe through a smaller hole. Or we can even do the four, seven, eight breathing can work wonders when it comes to our anxiety patients. Basically, you're telling the patient, chill out on the inhale and exhale and keep some of that precious CO2 inside. All right, besties, that's a wrap on respiratory alkalosis. We've learned that breathing too fast means that CO2 is gonna be escaping like a runaway balloon, but now you know exactly how to bring it back down to earth. If this video helpful, make sure that you give it a big thumbs up. If you have any questions or comments, make sure that you leave them down below. We love answering your questions. Head over to nursechungstore.com where you can snatch up this PowerPoint and any other goodies that we have available in the store. And as always, go take a deep breath but not too many. We don't want you going into alkalosis. Keep being awesome and we're gonna catch you in the next video.